obviously the influence of illegal drugs. And that, that um, manifests itself in a, in a number of ways. Some of the burglary, larceny, um, conspiracy to, to um, possess and to sell drugs. I mean, all that's related. Um, obviously, the drug problem, the courts only have, you know, so much ability to combat it. You know, there's so many uh, stakeholders in that process and, and so many, you know, above our pay grade, you know, federal policy, um, border policy, all this. Um, but what's coming into our community is um, some pretty dangerous stuff. I mean, we've got, when I started, there was home-baked meth labs. I can't tell you the last time we had, like, a homemade meth lab. All the, all the meth that comes in is crystal meth. It's manufactured um, almost exclusively. When I started seven and a half years ago, cocaine was a problem. Almost never see cocaine anymore. Um, most of the drunk driving or driving under the influence, I shouldn't say drunk, is not alcohol that I see. Most of it's under the influence of some drug. So all of these crimes peripherally, even the burglaries, the, grant, the, the break-ins, the, the larceny, um, it's usually at the root of it, people trying to, um, trying to steal property, to break in to steal, to sell the property for drug money. I mean, that, that, is a, that is a big part of it. And we have people that are selling drugs so they can use. I mean, I don't know how much, I, you'd have to talk to the police. They know more, much more about it than me. But what I see is, I haven't seen it. I mean, most of the, the bigger time dealers are, are prosecuted federally. Um, you'll see an article now and then in a paper about some folks that were rounded up there, some major dealers. And they're around, but most of our people that I see probably are down the ladder of selling and using, selling to use. Um, and it, it's a terrible blight on, on this culture. And in the last seven and a half years, in our child abuse neglect cases alone, I'm not talking about criminal cases, and I do Hampshire County, it would take these 10 fingers eight and two thumbs, and probably someone else's yours to count how many overdose drug, drug deaths we've had of parents just in this community. And most of them are not individuals that are trying to take their own lives. They're accidental. And they're accidental because they don't know what is in the drug that they're taking. And they're, you know, the last couple of years, we've seen a very dangerous, toxic, deadly combination of of fentanyl um, and meth, many parents um, pass away that overdosed. We had one one set of kids, both parents in a matter of three months in a case, both overdosed and died. Those children were orphaned, two or three kids orphaned in one case. A fair amount, certainly a large majority of cases have that common element, regardless of what the crime is. That's what I see. Day Report has greatly expanded their resources and services, not only to people that are on like pretrial bond um, in the criminal process or, or probation, which is post-conviction, um, but also I've seen their um, resources and services offered grow uh, tremendously the last year or two for parents in abuse and neglect cases, especially those that overlap with a criminal case. But even, even the, the parents who aren't in a criminal case um, with uh, parenting classes, domestic violence uh, classes that hopefully counsel people against being violent and aggressive to their families. Um, therapy, a lot of this is done by video. It's telehealth, which we didn't have before. Um, Drug screening process has been, I think, perfected. Um, so um, 
a lot of drug support, a lot of support groups that have access through that process. Um, so the state of the DRC, Day Report Center, I think it's essential. I mean, there's no way at this point we don't have the capacity. Even if we wanted to put everybody in jail, that's not possible. There are people that clearly need to be in jail. They're violent. Um, those that are in majorly um, egregious drug cases, um, the sexual abusers, et cetera. Clearly, there's a lot of those that, that are in jail and in a secure facility for good reason. But there, there's a large amount of people that um, can be addressed through community corrections. So we, it's not possible to run this process without it. And because we need it, and I'm on the Community Corrections Board, there has to be one circuit judge in each, cir each circuit on the Community Corrections Board. I'm privy to a lot of what's happening locally with the expansion of DRC. And it's been a positive for us. I expect them to continue to expand, not only for the, uh, for the supervision on the criminal side, but also for families in, in the process. So I'm, I'm happy with the way that's, that's heading. This circuit, because of Judge Carl's leadership, I believe, and I just adopted what he had. We are probably one of the few circuits in the state that supervise uh, individuals on bond through our probation office and through DRC. And we do that because it makes people accountable on bond, waiting for their trial or waiting to enter a plea, whatever it is. Um, they have supervision. They have supervision by the probation office and a lot of them through the DRC. So they're accountable to the court, they're accountable to the community. And if they can't conform and comply with their terms, then they're put in jail until they have their trial. So we even do that prior to trial, which I, I don't know of any other circuit that does that. Yeah. And it makes a much safer community and it gives us a way of supervising those individuals and keeping them accountable. As far as the drug court, I would probably defer to Judge Carl because he's the drug court judge. On a personal note, I, I sit in cases where individuals will ask to go to drug court or I'll ask certain attorneys, would your client consider going to drug court? I wouldn't do that if I didn't know who runs our drug court, Judge Carl and Sarah Royal, who I mean, I've talked to the probation director at the state, at the Supreme Court, that our drug court, right down to our, how we do it and our graduations, are tops. They run very well. And our success, success rate speaks for itself. And that's because we have a director and staff that are very uh, careful about who they select, the people that are motivated, the people that are already set up that want to succeed, they don't play games, they don't, they hold people accountable. If you're there just to check a box, it won't work. When you're in drug court, you have to, for example, get permission on who you date. That's how strict it is. Because those you associate with are extremely, it's extremely important who you associate with, good. Because if you don't, if you're around those that are still doing drugs or that you have access for drugs, you will fail. So it's very stringent and the success rate has been exceptionally good in this circuit. And I think it's because of Judge Carl's leadership, Sarah Royal's leadership, and how much they care. I know there's people that might not understand the drug court. Again, like DRC, there's no way that you could operate without it because there's just too many cases there's not enough space to jail everybody. And the drug court and our bond supervision both have um, components of sanctioning people. I mean, if you get out of line in drug court, you get sanctioned, you go to jail. If you, if you do the same on bond, you go to jail, just like probation. So I'm proud of our probation department and our supervision here. Um, I think people are accountable, and I think that that makes for success. I wouldn't hesitate to, to recommend the right people to go through our drug court. It's been very successful and it's run very well.
you know, if the community has any questions about it, they can inquire and more than happy to share that with them. I think the hardest part of any job is if you care, and we all should care, especially for public servants, because we're working for our communities. So number one, we should work hard. We should work more hours, not less than those in private um, business, in my opinion. It's hard, it's hard sometimes for me, I'm sure for all judges, because when you, you know, when you're an advocate, you sit on either side and you're looking at the bench and you're advocating your side and the other side's advocating their side. When you're, when you're on this side of the bench looking at everybody else and you have to decide and both, Kate, both sides have merit, that's tough. Um, you have to really dig in and know what the law is. We don't make law. There's days that I'm not sure I completely agree with the policy on all law that's passed. But that's not my job to decide if a law is right or wrong unless it's constitutionally challenged. So most of our cases, the, the law is clearly spelled out. And, you know, when you have advocates that are doing their job, it makes it tough. You have to know, um, you have to know what the law is. You have to know the relevant facts to apply. And that's what I'm saying, especially with civil cases, because there are so many um, types of causes of action, claims, defenses. It's difficult to find the time and the energy to dig into all that to try to get it right. Um, the other thing is, again, if you care and you're a human being, and I hope we all are, um, I hope I always want to check myself. I hope I'm becoming, I don't want to become less of a human being doing this job. I want to become more of a human being and see the parties and the people that come before me that way. So there are days when you have to, um, I guess this is the only way to say it, you have to, um, you have to be pretty firm and it affects people's lives, their liberty, their future, their finances, their family, their kids. Um, and sometimes that's tough, even though they deserve it. That is, that's a tough one. If you care, and we should care, but sometimes it's just like uh, a parent with tough, tough love. Sometimes that's the most important type that you have to exercise with your children, even though it's hard, um, you still have to do it. And also when both sides are prepared and they put on a good case, you know, when I hear one of them, I'll say that, yeah, I think I'm going with you. Then I hear them and they put on a good argument, well, maybe I'm going with you. That's hard. And you have to put in the time and the effort, um, the hard work. You have to do the work to try to get it right. And we don't always get it right. And luckily there's an appellate court. If we don't, that'll tell us we're wrong. We may get something wrong, but it's not because we haven't tried. Probably um, that I was a farm kid. I grew up on a farm. Um, my mom and dad had layer houses, um, had to gather eggs. They had like 11,000, uh, chickens in one house. So at their peak, they would lay, I don't know, 5,000 eggs a day. So, you know, I had to help my mother and, you know, the people they hired for that. So we grew up working almost exclusively on a farm and, um, my dad had a big cattle farm, uh, Angus black Angus cattle. So we, uh, you know, that was our life. That was, you know, I never really had a social life till I was, you know, almost out of high school because, you know, we grew up doing all the farm stuff, which I'm glad. I mean, you learn so much about hard work and, and taking care of animals and trying to understand the weather and so many things that impact um, that might be out of your control. I was the first of my family. No, we never had any lawyers in our family. And, um, I never really knew that I would go to law school. It just kind of happened. Um, and nor did I think perhaps I'd ever be a judge. That 
kind of was a timing thing. And, um, but that probably is something maybe most people don't know. We were big into 4-H and FFA um, growing up. My mom was a 4-H leader. And I'm really, looking back, I'm happy that I did because of all the lessons that you learn. I'm not sure these are in order of most important, but number one, um, we still, we live in a country where we still select those who govern over us. And I'm glad that I live in a country where we still, the people, decide who governs us. I would not want to live in a country where we were told or dictated to who governs us. So I'm glad we still live in a country like that. And that's why, regardless of who anybody votes for, I, I just tell people, please exercise your right to vote. I mean, it's one of the most sacred things we have and can do, um, regardless of who your candidate is. So that's number one. Um, number two, um, the people that have, that are running, I would say, I am so, I congratulate you. I commend you, applaud you, because the electoral process is grinding. It's, it's a grinding process. You know, to throw your hat in the ring and have to be publicly judged, that's, that's a tough one. And we need good people. We need solid, honest, hardworking people that will pick up the gavel, so to speak, and, and work for John Q. Public. Um, there's no more important job. Um, and that's hopefully part of why I do this. It's hopefully out of a sense of responsibility um, because I have kids and I want to see my kids grow up in the same country that I grew up in. And I hope to live to see their kids. And I hope, you know, what I'm doing uh, along with Judge Carl, again, who I so appreciate because of what he's taught me, that we're leaving our court system as good or better than we found it. And I feel like we're stewards of the process of, of the system. It's just ours for a short time, but we're stewards of it. And hopefully we're being good, honest stewards. So I'd like to continue to do that. Um, and it'll be up to everybody else to decide.